right. Is that too loud? Because I can get really loud. And the other thing I like to do is walk around, especially this after dinner speaking business. I've been where you are. Nine o'clock in the morning to dinner. I'm tired. I want to go home. I want to go drink. So I drank out there before I came in because I knew this was going to be a tough crowd. Um, I would like to say this, that uh, I really appreciate being here because I, I love the fact and I respect the fact that you have chosen as your profession, your avocation, coaching and teaching. We live in a time when coaching and teaching and mentoring young people is probably as important as it has been since I've been alive, and that's been a hell of a long time. Uh, so congratulations on that. Keep up the good work. Uh, also keep in mind that I have a great deal of respect for anybody who can get out of the bed in the morning by themselves at my age. So I just turned uh, 70, which is about 15 years longer than I thought I'd live. So I don't exactly know what I'm going to do. Um, I want to thank Marco for inviting me. Uh, two reasons. One, this was the first time in 47 years today, PLU, had their opening coaches meeting. It's the first time in 47 years when I haven't been to a coaches meeting. Uh, in fact, it was kind of, am I done? <laughs> it was kind of, we have batteries? Let me see. Anyway, while he's trying to figure it out, it was kind of cool because I'm driving down here and uh, Rolling Stones come on the radio. You know who the Rolling Stones are, right? And uh, Beast of Burden, and they're singing Beast of Burden. And I'm thinking, in 1970, when I went to my first coaches meeting, I'm driving to the meeting, I'm really nervous. Who comes on the radio? The Rolling Stones, Beast of Burden. So that has to be some kind of sign, right? <laughs> Probably that old guys stick together, that kind of thing. Boy, this reminds me of the days when I taught political science in uh, high school. I get these looks like, holy, what the hell is he? All right, let's try this. Let's try this. There is a dearth which means a lack of leadership in the world today. Why? Why? Yes. Okay. Come on, somebody else. She broke the ice. I don't think you can teach leadership. You're either born with it or you're not. Ooh. Ooh. You know, I thought that exact same thing until I was in this business for about 20 years. And then I thought, no, I think you can teach leadership. Now, they got to be the right people with the right makeup, but I think you can teach it. In fact, I think if you're a leader, that's what your job is. To teach other people to be leaders. <clears throat> Anybody else? People are afraid to fail. People are afraid to fail. Do you have do you coach a lot of kids who are afraid to fail? Have you ever coached a kid who's afraid to be successful? Yeah, that, that's almost as bad. Because when you're successful, what does that bring? Expectations. That E word. That E word. Okay. I maintain this. That 
leadership is hard because if you're going to be a leader, you kind of have to bury your soul. If you're going to be a leader, you certainly have to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. If you're going to be a leader, you have to practice what you preach. When you're a leader, there's no such thing as situational ethics. In other words, I'm going to be ethical when it helps me, and then sometimes I'm not going to be ethical. All right, you have a handout there, and what's the next thing on the handout? You wouldn't tell me why leadership is hard or what leadership is. What's the next thing on there? Thoughts about you and leadership. Who is the best leader? Oh, okay, now this you can do. <laughs> Even in your in your stupor, you can do this. Who in your lifetime, in your lifetime, is the best leader that you have been associated with? Just think about that. Who's the best leader you've ever been associated with? I haven't been associated with him, but it's John Wood. John Wood, okay. You know, the interesting thing, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar just published a book called uh, Coach Wooden and Me. And see, I'm a believer that leadership is basically teaching and modeling on steroids. That's, that's what I think it is. And there's a, a paragraph in the book when Kareem talks about uh, Wooden's memorial service. And he had 19 of his players spoke at the memorial service. Not one of them mentioned wins or losses, championships. What they talked about was lessons learned that they applied in life. Jabbar says if you'd have been an alien and you'd walked into that ceremony, you'd have never known John Wooden was arguably the best basketball coach that ever lived. He was a great teacher. That's what they would have got. So I think you have a legitimate point there. But anybody that you know, who's the best leader? You must, you must have, we can narrow this down. Parents. Okay, parents. How about a coach? Any coaches that you've had? What does that mean? We'll say it. Okay. Good deal. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that that's something he treasures. So you got to tell him that once in a while, right? <laughs> okay, now you got a checklist on this thing. I want you to look at it just quickly. Now, what I'm doing here in 45 minutes is giving you a three to five hour program that I do. So I apologize for the rapidity with which we're doing this. All right, look at them. Check them off. Just mentally check them off. We're all, are those all things that you can do? can't do all those things, then leadership's going to be a problem. By the way, does anybody know what a conundrum is? What is it? A problem. An issue. A puzzle. And that's what leadership and culture is it's a conundrum. If you don't have good leadership, you're never going to have a good culture. By the way, how many of you have ever worked in a bad culture? 
Okay. So, one of the things I learned going through this process is you can have a culture by design or you can have a culture by default. But you're going to have a culture. You're going to have a culture by design or by default. Okay, flip the page. Or maybe it's on the back, I don't know. But on the back, and then let me see one of these. Oh yeah. Why don't I get my copy and then I want to bother everybody. Okay, since we're having so much individual participation here, <laughs> I have an ego. Anybody in here doesn't have an ego? Okay. One of the things you have to be able to do is surrender your ego if you're going to be a leader. And I'm not going to use any samples from today's leaders, but you have to surrender. One of the things you have to have is thick skin. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about my skin. This will be exciting for you. <laughs> a 70-year-old man is going to tell you a story about his skin. <laughs> First couple of years I coached, but it's in the projects in Columbus, Ohio. One particular game, there was a woman sitting behind the bench, and every, seemed like every three minutes, call a timeout, call a timeout. <laughs> and I, I want to tell you that the year before, we had gone to the big school state final championship game, so help. I thought I was a pretty good coach. Call a timeout. <laughs> so, and it was one of those games, you ever have a game where you take your team to a game and it looks like you just pick them up on the street in the bus, that they're out, they don't know what the hell they're doing, and six weeks of practice is gone. So, I finally told my assistant, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And I said, I don't know. About that time, coach, call a timeout. <laughs> and I'm ashamed to say what I did. But I turned around. I didn't know who it was, but I looked in the direction of the stands, and I said, but you. <laughs> so, I hope that didn't offend anybody, but that, that's where I was. So, we lose by two or three points. No, I didn't even care. You know, sometimes winning doesn't take the place of how badly you've played. You know, you've set the game back 50 years, but we won. Oh, okay. So as I'm walking out of the, the gym, all of a sudden I feel these hands around my neck and something on my back. And it was the Call a timeout woman <laughs> who had rushed the floor and was going to strangle me. <laughs> Which, at that particular time, I really didn't give a damn. <laughs> so the police got her off. <laughs> to make a long story short, the principal calls me in the office the next day and he says, what are you doing? And then he shut the door. And he said, you know, I wanted to do that. <laughs> but, but you can't do that. You can't do that. 
can't do it. But then it turns out, too, the woman was my best player's sister. <laughs> so anyway, my skin wasn't very thick. However, 15 years later, same thing happened. Only, it's a man sitting behind the bench. Why don't you run this? Why don't you do that? Take so-and-so out. I mean, no matter what we did. So, I've learned my lesson. I've matured, I think is what they call it. After the game was over, I went up in the stands and I introduced myself. My name's Steve Dickerson, what's yours? So he said, I said, do you mind telling me what you do for a living? And he said, I'm a painter. And I said, oh, is it landscapes, portraits, houses? I'm a house painter. Oh. Are you painting any houses in the neighborhood? <laughs> well, yeah, by the way, I am. So I said, okay, could you give me the address? <laughs> so the next day, same principles. I've been blessed with people to put up with my crap for years. Same principle. He says, uh, now what? That's what he always said. I said, look, I gotta, I gotta leave school for a little while. I have an errand to run. And he said, you know, you're not gonna, no, I'm not gonna swear at anybody. I'm not gonna do anything. So I get in the car, find the address, get to it. He's up on a ladder with his back, painting a peak. So I get my lawn chair out of the back. <laughs> Take it, put it in the front yard, and I just sit there. And finally, he looks down. He says, Coach? I said, Yeah. I said, Hey, you know, I think you missed the spot over there. And I think the paint over there is a little uneven. I think that needs a little touch up. So he looks at me, starts down the ladder. My wife says, I'm lucky you didn't have a gun. <laughs> uh, he comes over and he says, Coach, I get it. I get it. Came to all the games after that, never said boo about what we were doing. So, I didn't have thick skin, but I developed thick skin. I also realized that if you don't surrender your ego, you can't empower other people on your team or in your organization to take responsibility for things. Now, this is another question that's tough. How many of you have actually, in some metaphysical state, done self-actualization? You know what self-actualization is, right? That's why kids will come in and we'll come in to talk and they'll say, Coach, you just not give me any confidence. And I said, Junior, it's called self-confidence for a reason. You're the one that's not giving me any confidence. <laughs> So anyway, and I'm, I'm sure at the risk of going over, I, I wish you would read through these things because these are things that, and, and the core belief part is what we're going to really jump to next because we want to talk a little bit about culture, but uh, these are things that, that some people don't understand. Leaders have to listen. I mean, that, that's one of the things I learned. The first 15 years I did this, I knew everything. But when I started listening, I really started learning stuff. So, um, let me ask you this question. Well, let me tell you this. The last, last one is important. Triangle of trust. 
Okay, you can't do anything without trust, particularly build a culture, coach a team, or whatever. So there's a triangle. There's three kinds of trust. All right, there's character, there's competence, and there's a connection. Character, the people that you coach and the people that you work with watch you. They want to make sure you are doing what you tell them to do. They watch you. That's the character part. The confidence part is obviously, do you know the game of basketball or whatever sport it is? Are you confident? The connection part is the most important. And that part is getting to know the people that you coach on a non-athletic level. I've done two things in my career and it's amazing what kids remember 20 years after you coached them. But the one thing they remember is for 47 years, I've met once a week with each one of my players at a set time for 15 minutes, just the player and I in my office, the only thing they couldn't talk about was basketball. They could talk about, obviously we were concerned about academics. I even let them talk about their love life. But I want them to see that I'm not the ogre that I would appear to be from four to six. The other thing is, I established a leadership council. And that would be three or four upperclassmen that you trust. For example, in college, you have sophomores, juniors, and seniors. You never have a freshman on your leadership council in college because they don't know what the hell is going on most of the time. But these are people that you trust. And it empowers them. They have a responsibility. If something's going on with this team that I need to know, tell them. And then the other kids realize that they have some representation. Some representation. Okay. How much time have I got? About 20 minutes. Oh, really? Jeez. <laughs> they were hoping you were going to say two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so leadership is important. Now, can somebody tell me, please, I'm doing all the freaking talking. Tell me what a culture is. Now, when I was a kid playing, that word wasn't even used. My coaches never, I played basketball, one year at Washington State from Mara Parshman. Great, great man. But he didn't want to talk to you. He wanted to teach you how to play basketball. He didn't want to talk to you. And then I played for Bobo Brayton, baseball for four years. Another great man. Bobo would talk to you when you weren't hitting or weren't fielding or it was connected with a game. So this whole culture business was something I had to learn. What, what's, what's a culture? The environment. The environment. Now, in your mind, what's your name? See, Dan, I used to be able to read that from here, but I can't, which means I gotta go to the eye doctor, I guess. Uh, okay, Dan, what's your vision of the perfect environment. That's good, Dan. Like somebody else. Honest to God, you act like you don't want to say anything because if you give the wrong answer, I'm going to come over and hit you over the head with the microphone. There isn't any wrong answers. I think it's a belief in a system. That's good. Belief in a system? I was going to say a set of beliefs and behaviors within an environment. 
That's very good. You want? <laughs> Anybody else? When you have kids that are willing to sacrifice for the greater good of the team. Okay. All right. You guys are good. See, when you wake up, you're good. Anybody else?
that the most important person in my life is my wife. Now, the only thing I can figure, I don't go in the locker room every day and write on the board, okay, the most important person in the world is my wife. Remember that, so when you see her, you'll tell her it's on the board. I don't do that. So I must model it. I must model it. Now, if you will do me one last favor, and then I'm going to leave you alone, I think. If you will look at this handout very seriously, there's a page in there, the last page. There are two examples of cultures. Oh, by the way, let me just tell you this, for those of you that don't know. One of the sages, uh, most knowledgeable people in the history of the world had this quote. And it was Mike Tyson. <laughs> now, if you guys laugh at Mike Tyson, people laughed at Marshawn Lynch, right? Because he wouldn't talk. Uh, Mar Marshawn could buy and sell everybody on the Seahawks except Paul Allen, I think. He's smart. But he's street smart, and people don't recognize that sometimes. Mike, I don't know about Mike, but Mike had a quote that we opened a lot of conferences with. Mike Tyson's quote was, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> now, what that means is, you've all got strategy. You've all got strategy. But when strategy doesn't work, when the scheme doesn't work, when the technique doesn't work, then you always fall back on culture because that's all about attitude and effort. It's all about attitude and effort. Now, what I have here is just copies for you of two cultures. One is Urban Meyer's culture at Ohio State. And he definitely says what they believe. He definitely says, how do we model that? And he definitely is measuring it. Most of it is football related. Mine at PLU was a little different. My baseline for the culture of PLU is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. What does that emphasize? Teamwork. Teamwork. And I can't tell you the number of people who have come up to me and said, so-and-so is one of your players. He works for me now. I said, well, good. He says, yeah, that's what he says all the time in meetings. He says in team meetings, that's what he says all the time. I said, well, good, good. So do not exit the same way that you entered. How do you measure that? How do you measure? Physically, mentally, emotionally. Academically, that's how you measure. Are you going to the weight room? Are you performing in the classroom? Compete, always compete. I have to believe that you just can't compete when you feel like it. You either compete or you don't compete. So they compete in the classroom. They compete on the court. Embrace the grind. Being a college student is a friggin' grind. Being a college student athlete is really a grind. There's ups and downs, wins and losses, the whole nine yards. It's embracing. That's life. Collective responsibility. We did a great thing uh, two years ago. In my mind, the biggest sport in the world for collective responsibility is rowing. So I made them go out and practice with the crew team. That fortunately, no one drowned. Uh, <laughs> but they knew then if they had any doubt what collective responsibility is. Being the best teammate is the greatest thing that you can be. 
I firmly believe that. I firmly believe it. So what we do, we don't have any rules. We have a culture. I realized right off the bat when I was a young coach that after coming up with 25 rules, I had to do what? I had to come up with 25 punishments. And God Almighty, I was either, I was punishing most of the time. Wasn't coaching, I was punishing. So, the culture makes it easier for you. It makes it easier for you. And remember, you're gonna have one, so you might as well have one by design. You might as well put the effort into it. I don't know whether your athletic department has one. They need one. Each team can have your own culture, but the athletic department needs a culture. Our university at PLU, they have a university culture, but we have an athletic department culture, and all 19 teams have their own culture. But they all mesh together. It's hard. This leadership business and this culture business is hard. Really hard. And you don't want to even attempt to do it if you're not ready to uh, embrace the grind of it. Well, you have been, I guess, an average audience. Uh, one of my problems is I tell the truth. But again, you have not, I appreciate being here. I appreciate being anywhere at my age. And uh, again, I meant what I said in the beginning, that I applaud you for doing what you're doing. And please remember that our young people in this day and age really need your guidance, your mentorship, your modeling, and your help. Because these are, these are tough times. These are tough times. Thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure, and good luck to you. And now that I don't have a team, I may be wandering all over the Pacific Northwest when the season starts to watch some of your teams play. Thanks a lot. <laughs>